my name's John. I wasn't going to say John, I was meant to say Monroe said, no, fuck. Fuck the intro, that would clip up. At least I'm not going like, hi guys, I'm looking on my channel, I hate that shit. Right, so, anyone watching this, my name's John, hello. I was meant to call myself Munro78 for some reason, but that's not what I call myself online. I normally say I'm the Duke, but that seems played out, so whatever. See, I'm playing Elite Dangerous, and I'm flying towards that city, Nebula, just over there. And this little ship. Hey, yeah, that's too many cameras. It's kind of dark here, you can't see shit. Remember me, guy? Ooh, no worries. Any controls in this bit? Nothing like you would. L2 and R2 go up and down. L1 and R1 turn it. That is my. It's just the controls are weird as fuck, you. Yeah. Well done, I'm gonna show you the map. I've got 29 jumps to go. What I've done is I've started. I'll just show you the map and explain this. Have some coffee too, with dark. Okay, so when I started, obviously. Right. Oh, shit. So, when you start elite, Playing this, you're running about these stars here. That's the ones I've been flying around to start with. Oh, I've got a ship there. I forgot. Oh, it's my wee car thing. That's crap. And I bought that one back, so I didn't mean to make that ship. But I've got a couple of ships back, though. They're rubbish. One's a wee explorer, one's a wee fighter that was making. Alright, so I started at these stars, and then I thought, what I'm going to do is fly towards Sagittarius, which is quite far away. So jump after jump, uh, I've been moving. Zoom right out. So I started there, um, aiming towards there, but because it was too far, I couldn't make a plot right straight there, so I had to make like a jump and then a jump on the map. So halfway there, if I zoom in roughly where it was, I just came some fucking distance. I just made it go to the right. It's probably to the right, but this is right. Anyway, after I get, well, before I get to Sagittarius, which is somewhere in one of these stars, wherever it is in there, somewhere in this cluster, I can get there closer later. What I wanted to do on the way there was fly towards, see if I'm zooming properly here, that. That dark cluster there I want to see inside. I will AA-AH93. I want to be inside that. I want to see what space is like from inside this view. City out here where you can see the stars. I want to spin my ship into this. And see what it's like. So to get there, I've still got our 29 jumps to go. Boom, let's make it 28. I think that's the one I'm going to there. Like a certain dark cluster, I think it's in that one I'm going to. Oh, my podcast stopped, right? Pause up and pause this. I was not exactly out. Otherwise, if you can make it to audio, I might lose audio when it goes through. Mentioned that at the same time I'm playing this and listening to a Star Trek podcast called The Greatest Generation. They've been reviewing like Star Trek Next Generation episodes. Into season two, episode 17. It's a matter of the Stop it now. So, episode 17 of season two, The Samaritan Snare. I'm like a couple minutes in. The show? When you go to a, a Star Trek convention that we're playing this audio in the background to my Bluetooth. Obviously, I can't stream audio through my console at the same time because, like, digital rights management and shit. With the camera thing, I'm speaking in the background. I don't know if it's going to get picked up because there's no licensed music. 
this may this may be a couple, you may still hear about your people talking about Star Trek. So here we go. At a hotel, like is no, it just a bunch of gap in the in the chafing dishes? <laughs> All sorts of weird Star Trek food. It was uh, it was a really singular experience. It's the only thing I've been, like even been close to that re resembled a Star Trek convention. I've never attended one, but um, this was a very like I think of like when I've seen those on the internet, like what I think of is like a bunch of people, you know, oh, wait, oh I'm dressed as a as a doll. I'm not a Benzate at all. I'm just uh, outside the lobby having mm. a baby. <laughs> but these people were all human officers in Starfleet, and they had a very like they they all like, had rank on. hips on their uh -huh. on their like <laughs> uniforms that their moms made them, and they like were. None of them even had weird noses or ears. The audio no, like they, that was like, a step too far. And like rank was observed, so like we were at the at the bar. Fuck into it, that clip up. At least I'm not going like, hi guys, you're lucky on my channel. I hate that shit. Right. So anyone watching this, my name's John. Hello. Okay. Did you get forward a bit? This may be a cut. You may still hear the background. People talking. At a hotel, like is no, it just a bunch of in the in the chafing dishes? <laughs> <laughs> All sort of weird Star Trek food. It was, uh... Right, back there. Unpause. Audio levels seem tight. Like you can hear me? The background podcast seems okay. Of the Pocono has come to, like... Where normals go? Yeah. yeah. Who's giving the numbers? It would be, like, you know, 60% townies, okay. and then, like, 40%... Okay, okay. Dudes, dudes in... Let's make it 27 to go 27 in Like, you know, TNG uniforms. And like, if a guy was a lieutenant and a commander came up to the bar, he would get from. up and offer his... 27. <laughs> And, uh, That's not even like differential treatment that actually happens in the show. It was really different from what yeah. I understand. Like, it was, and, and, like, was it really about Star Trek at all? <laughs> I'm wondering. I mean, I think it was probably mainly a ruse for some kind of sex thing. But, yeah. Um, Were there weird uh, flaps in the uniform? I should have started <laughs> <laughs> from the Weird openings that you don't remember from the show? I didn't get close enough 27 to jumps open, because... but we did drive away and my wife just kind of had a thousand yard stare looking out the front window of her rental car and she's like, oh, better what, what, what did we just see? She's like, I could never love anyone who was into that. <laughs> <laughs> ever, ever. I was like, yeah, totally. I have no interest in any of the things that those people are doing. <laughs> the prophecy was false. <laughs> so this is the same hotel. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'm sure they change the sheets regularly. Were you trying to deter a yeah, possible to fire? Because <laughs> the people... I should have rethought this opening. <laughs> 2 7 is a magic number. <laughs> Right, oh, there's someone who was at that event who also listens to our show that was about to come. They're like, <laughs> well, fuck these guys. <laughs> yeah, I was totally looking at this. Twin is a magical like, number. Like, I was like a Republican senator who like votes against gay rights right. kind of guy. Sure. I was like two zero seven. Because I was secretly like more like those people that I wanted to admit. Yeah. So. Like, I would love to, like, get some context. If anybody knows what this thing is, like... 27 is a magic number. I would love Jesus to know, Christ, like, that's... what the fuck I saw, you know? Because I didn't see all of it. I just saw, like, the evidence of it in the halls and, like, the conference rooms. Like, I didn't attend any of, of the events, so... Yeah, don't... I mean, if you're guessing... I don't care about your guess. No. But if, but if you know what it was, if you know what it was, especially if you were there, yeah, drop us a line. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and terrifying. Yeah, the crack uh, crack uh, like on this episode, season two, episode the line, seventeen, Samaritan it's Snare, it's or as snare. I've cool, called are. it. Sci-fi of mice and men. <laughs> the packlets are going to pet Jordy a little too hard. 
Um, so Wes I have to see you is going to go take some more uh, some, some more Starfleet exams, and the Enterprise is going to uh, keep going. Uh, and Wes is some... like, can I borrow the car? <laughs> I gotta go to school. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. Like I feel like the um, the captain's log that they open this episode with. It, you know, like when whenever Picard refers to. Wesley and Captain's log, it's right. young Wesley Crusher will be going to, you know, <laughs> to Starbase 155 to pursue his, and it's like, <laughs> you really gotta do Picard more, man, that's solid. <laughs> but, like, while he says that, Just he then, like, the next scene is him bumping into Wesley on the bridge, and like, and like, telling Wesley that they're gonna be, going together. And it's so impersonal. It's like, like when Pat Picard is around Wesley, okay, yeah, that's like they don't know each other really. But right. if Where he's like that? making a captain's log, I don't know what I'm doing It's like, uh, what would be Picard's diary? He'd be like, wow, this dude is obsessed with me. <laughs> <laughs> he acts so fucking distant all the time. And... <laughs> When the ship got infected with the computer virus, yeah. and they were uh, thinking about dumping all the logs, yeah. like that must have been another angle that Picard had. About, uh, I, I don't want to lose all that all that juicy material. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we cut to a scene where Picard and Pulaski are really butting heads, and Pulaski is. Is, uh, is twanging on Picard that I'm he needs to, to go to the Starbase for a procedure. And <laughs> this is also really, I don't know, I, I, I noticed in watching this that I was laughing at this scene. Really so I'll just say that why I was laughing was they chose to have Blasky not say what the procedure was so that it could be a reveal later. You do have an ego. But it just, it just, uh, you can feel the finger quotes around the word procedure. Yeah. <laughs> and, and my mind was racing in the other direction to what the procedure could be. Yeah, they were talking about elements of his. I feel like it would like shit from Henson, right? Yeah, yeah. It's totally the penis and beginning that they were talking about. Sure. And I bet they do it great in the future. <laughs> Yeah, Great I, penis. <laughs> the best penis. <laughs> really classy. <laughs> One of the best penises in the fleet. <laughs> you could stick four pips on it. <laughs> uh, so... The pips are for her pleasure. <laughs> I love this podcast. So just dumb. The, the the nature of this argument though is that Picard could be getting this procedure from Pulaski, but he doesn't want to because he's like got appearances to keep up. And uh, there's like something kind of particular about his character is like he really doesn't want anybody on the ship to think he has a personal life that doesn't yeah. involve like nerding out about archaeology and reading books. Like it really to me is about not having his shit out on the streets. Right. Like, it's it's a privacy thing. Yeah, it's a privacy it's thing, a, and I think he... More than it's an uh, invincibility talk. thing. Yeah, well, I think that, like, he has this total aura. That's a wreck-looking thing, Joe. He has this total... <laughs> Come along, man. I've just, I've just turned just, away in my chair. It's just two guys sitting in a house in this... <laughs> It's just two guys sitting in a hot tub talking about Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> we could record a regular hot tub. They do have one here. Um, I feel like he, he I mean, maintains this aura by, by, having him, him, like, like, by keeping himself somewhat mysterious to his crew. At the same time, every time a crew member talks about Picard to any other crew member, it's never about how how invincible and rad he is. They're always talking about that. how what a great decision maker and reasoner he is. So no, like, his perception of himself is a little before. bit askew of what everyone else's perceptions are of him. But that's pretty interesting. I mean, like that's a that's a really like subtle like piece of writing if they're doing that intentionally. Yeah. I think given <laughs> given how this episode goes, 
That might be giving it way too much credit. That might be the only mark they hit. <laughs> right. So, uh, Picard and Wesley pile into the, uh, into the Premier. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this is after Picard, like, kind of... And we're going to play the lead map, and we're going to have all the stars and systems here. And, uh, I'm going to rush to get to the Nebula. To do the, uh, the science mission in Picard's absence. Many stations to go. Uh, to get the Enterprise. Uh, uh, the Enterprise uh, pull off down the street, and just as they turn around the corner, onto the main drag, the Enterprise picks up a distress signal. And it's a, it's kind of like a cryptic distress signal in that, like, there's just not a lot of, there's not a lot of meta tags on, <laughs> on this yeah. distress signal. It's general distress. Yeah. Uh, some, some dumpy little ship, uh, nearby is, uh, is putting out distress. They, they do all the classic, like, but if we go like enter this distress call, we'll be very far away from the captain. Which is a, a little misdirect because the captain is not really like I mean like if you They thought, should have separated the ship. <laughs> like do they only are they only able to separate the ship in times of battle? I don't know. Yeah, what's the rig rigs on that? I don't know. That seems like a perfectly legitimate reason to uh, fling the saucer back towards yeah. the star base. Yeah. I mean why not separate the ship just in general. Yeah, all like, the time. Maybe like half of the science ship is on the upper half and half of the science ship is on the bottom half. I don't know. Why do we have to come up with all this great stuff? <laughs> <laughs> so tweet at Star Trek Room if you want head scratchers like this not to be a part of the upcoming Star Trek series. Because we'll make sure that should get straightened out before the script is finalized. I really do want people to tweet at Star Trek Room though. Like I. Like, a lot of people have, and we really appreciate it. I want this to be, like, something that is a sustained, like, siege on that Twitter account. Where they're like, fuck, well, at least it's going to be with these guys so that when we tell them no, they feel like they got a fair shake, right? That would be great. Yeah, I would love a meeting. But if you're listening to this and you're within the same voice and you have a Twitter account, please tweet us. If you're within the sound of our voices, or... You're in some weird bedroom. <laughs> See if you can help us out. The store locks from the outside, right, Ben? <laughs> so they find this ship, they get the FaceTime up and running, and there's a guy with like real Fisting. gnarly vertical eyebrows. You're Patrick. Our ship is the Mondor. <laughs> like a, he's, he, they kind of look like they're wearing like the still suits from Dune. Yeah. Moods of fame for cattle and love play, not fighting. The whole vibe felt very Dune-y. Yeah. yeah. The, it's like it's like if the Baron Harkonnen was wearing a still suit and on a ship. This is what these guys look like. That's oh, exactly where I was at. Yeah. I feel like they um, moving on. I'm not totally for my taste though. Ten tweet. Ten tweet. But these guys are real, real dummies from the jump. We are far from home. We need help. They speak in very speech. like kind of monosyllabic speech patterns, much like I am doing now, right. trying to characterize how they speak. They uh, <laughs> they sound like a ship full of simple jacks. We look for things. <laughs> yeah. uh, and like Data makes the point that like maybe their speech is not super well developed, but they're like otherwise smart which is like giving them so much credit like what is your problem good guy data is <laughs> like yeah maybe maybe they're smarter than they appear and Jordy's like these guys are fucking dumb <laughs> and, and the way that Jordy always seems to do that <laughs> Yeah, Jordy, maybe more than anybody on the ship, is really sure of his opinions. Yeah. It's like, Damn, he's ugly. I admit, well, maybe him and Worf, like, are the two that really, like, believe in where they're coming from. Yeah. Like, everybody else kind of, like, always goes over and stews on, yeah, on, yeah, uh, freak. on these issues. Yeah. Jordy has a, has a point of view and he's sticking to it. <laughs> so USS Dumpy is broken. <laughs> 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 and the first idea that the Enterprise crew <laughs> has is like, hey, let's send over Jordy. Let's send over our best. He can stick these guys back together no problem. Yeah, and he's like, oh, I'll, I'll fix this in no time. And uh, I, I was thinking that this is like basically the same 
type of problem that they were confronting in the pen pals issue. Fuck you, man. Like, what's great about that is that we're in the same room and you just got double middles from me. Because that's exactly where I was going. This is what I want to talk about. Yeah. Why isn't this a prime directive problem? What makes the prime directive applicable on the other planet and not here? These guys are idiots. Right. And that's as far as we know, pre-warp, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe this ship is pre-warp and the pack leads are... Oh. I don't know. I thought it was weird programming, like, to put this episode so near to that one, too. This episode feels like it was scripted in season one, and they, like, yeah, were like, fuck, we have a week. Yeah, like, it's, like, there's a lot about it that feels very season one. Yeah. What's interesting about that characterization, though, is that characters are saying things like that, too. Totally. Not unsubtly. Like, when they hatch the idea to send Jory over, Warp is like... What kind of idea is that? It's a terrible plan. Yeah, yeah, like, he's kind of indispensable. Yeah. We're sending him over alone, <laughs> and we don't know anything about these people. Riker's like, just chill, dog. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, a few people have probably sent us this at this point. Uh, the super cut of Time's Wharf gets told to shut up. Yeah. And, like, disagreed with. Like, and, and a lot of the time when Wharf raises a, a red flag like this, like, he is predicting the predicament. Yeah. Like... Always bet on Worf, really. Worf is, uh, is not easy to scam. You know? Like, if you were running a... If you were running a short time, you would want to, like, try, you know... You don't want to try to sell him jewelry at the gas station. No, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to, like, have him break a 20 and then give you back three tens or whatever. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so you gotta flip over your three card monitor table. Yeah. So Jordy beams over there and like the pack led, and they're all like big like. Uh, they're all grimaces. They're all like, and, and it's a little unclear if like they're all kind of cast as that or if it's like if it's a, kind of like a big fat suit that they're wearing. But they're all just kind of like big heavy guys, and they like start like converging on him. And he's like, oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they're big, but they're also a little soft looking. They're like, like hunched uh, over. Like Weird Al in the fat video. Yeah, it's one of like of, of the alien species that we've seen. Like one of the more fully like these guys are all, all like cast as like like they're cast for like hairline, they're cast for body type, and they're cast for like rest of the face. <laughs> All yeah. have the same like weird expression on their face. It's like pretty like interesting. They look like that Twilight Zone episode. Oh, of, I don't know. Of this the one. doctors performing surgery, like beautification oh. surgery. Oh yeah. And, like, the doctor, the yeah. Once once Jordy gets them to like calm down, though, I felt like Jordy was like kind of at home. Like it's like the sociopath is on the ship full of sociopaths. And. Yeah, not only that, but like, he's super at home being the best around idiots. <laughs> I think he's sort of got a kick out of that. Yeah, yeah. Like being real condescending. He's like... Being condescending in a way that the person you're being condescending to can't protect. Right. That's his... That, he loves that. Yeah. If you ever hear somebody going, Listen, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, this was probably a blessing on their, uh, on their road trip. Yeah. Uh, so they have six hours ahead of them in, in the uh, in the Parabia. They took it into the Toyota dealership and had it tuned up for the trip. Picard is like, he's just fucking pissed off that he has to do this in the first place. And Wesley is really like catching feelings about that. Like he's he's taking it personally. Like. Picard is pissed at him. Shut up, Wesley! But really, Picard is pissed that he's going at all. There's a couple levels of tension here, though, too. That is definitely the A story tension. <laughs> the B story tension is like time alone with someone you really respect or, or like who has hero status for you right. for a long period of time. And like, we just came from a place yeah. at this Max Fun Con with like awesome comics. 
and really cool creators. Yeah. And I feel like that's something that is relatable to me in the immediate term. Right. Hanging out with people that you really like and admire isn't easy. And so I think Wes has some of that going for him too. Right, yeah. It's like it's like you don't want, you want them to come away from that thinking well of you and and hopefully like the next time you see them they like wanna high five you or whatever, like, hey man or whatever. But Wesley is like probably not playing it as cool as as one would want. Like, it's a lot of like Picard trying to focus on the one of the like many Asian that he brought and like Wesley kind of like niggling him with little questions and and Picard like slamming the book and going into the back and <laughs> There's that, but there's also that weak ass writing of well, this happens to real life too. You'll be you'll be at a place with someone and they'll just say like, like apropos of nothing, and then you'll be like, "What's going what's, on? What's on your mind?" <laughs> yeah, and Picard does that a couple times in these scenes too, in the shuttle where he's like, yeah, "My stupid heart." <laughs> you see, Wesley, sometimes a father <laughs> has a heart condition and. He has to have surgery, Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> From time to time, <laughs> after a Nosikin sticks a knife through your chest, Theo, <laughs> he sticks it through you like a popsicle stick. <laughs> he gets to sticking and to stabbing and to beeping and to booping. <laughs> Until your heart goes blah. <laughs> I got you that time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So the the procedure is that Picard's Picard's heart is fake, and it is fake because one time he got in a bar brilliance called Nosikins, and. One of them held him on a knife, and um, it was a pretty badass Barbara story. It was. I felt like a little weird about it because when he described like the Nosikins coming in, he's like kind of picked a fight with them because they were Nosikins. Yeah. He was like, "Damn, Picard, you did some some seriously racist <laughs> shit." <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh, you were just in a small town oh. bar, and some guys not your oh, race your came in. <laughs> enough to for you to like want to pick a fight with them? <laughs> oh man, I wonder if we'll ever see that story. I wonder, Adam. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe maybe it'll appear. Yeah, maybe a little... it'll come up again. Yeah. Wesley is not super woke because he didn't call Picard out on his like race shit. Uh, but his eyes do they do get pretty wide because yeah. I mean Picard's. An older man, you don't expect him to be the type that picks fights in a in an outpost chili. <laughs> a, a, a starbase outpost can't eat good in that neighborhood. <laughs> Do you think it's a Chili's too? Greatest Gen, brought to you by Chili's. <laughs> it's eating good in the neighborhood. I was just thinking that it might be Applebee's, but. Uh, I don't know. Well, I don't really know the difference between those two restaurants. I don't think there is any difference. Right, I think the trucks works. go both places. Can really find what's that? Can really what's that? Is that enough of like a 15 minute break after the episode? Are we getting back in now? <laughs> uh, Troy runs onto the ship and he's like, she's like, those guys aren't dumb, they're evil. And, and uh, Ranker's like, what, really? And so they radio up Jordy, and he's like, no, like, I'm just fixing this stuff. Yeah, but they've been watching the episode, though, on the view screen. I think yeah, they have. Like, they've got, yeah, they, 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 they put Skype on mute, and they're just kind of watching what's going on. Yeah. Either that, or, like, they don't care if the backlets hear what they're talking about. <laughs> but, uh, there's some shenanigans. Like, I think Jordy fixes the guidance or the, I don't know, navigation system or something. Jordy's like the super at like a divey uh, rental apartment <laughs> that's like coming in and, and like the pack lights are like, yeah, my sink's 
something's wrong with my sink, and then the sink gets fixed, and they're like, well, yeah, I mean, this outlet doesn't work, <laughs> can you fix that? They're like, just pointing at shit, and Jordy's and fixing it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, like, eventually, like, the ship is back up and running, and uh, the Panklets grab his phaser and blast him before the uh, Enterprise can beam him back. And they... He's got the little card clicker phaser. Oh yeah, is that what it is? I think so. I didn't get a close look at the phaser because I was uh, drifting in and out of sleep. It fucking um, blew him across the room. Yeah. yeah. He, he like got some air, for sure. Like, uh, it, it's, it's more violent than the stun setting usually looks. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, and they hit him with a few times in this episode. Yeah. Uh, really close range. Yeah, so uh, they put up a shield uh, that Data determines is similar to Romulan shielding, which is way past what this dumb little ship yeah. is supposed to have. It's like putting 30 inch rims on a piece of shit Tercel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they have a, a lot of, like, fox racing decals in their back window. <laughs> don't make a lot of sense here in their body shape. <laughs> like, I don't know how active a lifestyle you guys really have. What does a Camry need with Nas? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, they, they reveal their, their, their true nature, which is that they are taking, they're taking Jordy hostage, not to, like, get something out of the Enterprise specifically, but like they, yeah. they'll, they'll, they're happy to just have Jordy as like that. a engineering slave on their ship, if, that if that's like the best thing they can get out of it, but if the Enterprise wants him back, like they're gonna need, like, like daddy's gonna need to get his medicine, and mm -hmm. that means like, like give us all of the files on your computer, and give us technology, and give us weapons, and, and they're like, reading through Picard's logs, like, who the fuck is this Wesley? <laughs> Delete. <laughs> Irrelevant. Um, yeah, this is a little bit of a conundrum for uh, for Riker while uh, the captain is away. So, to be clear, Riker was given two chances to do the right thing. I don't know if you saw this shot. He's like draped himself over the captain's chair. Like, I think yeah, he's... He's really, like, man-spreading. He's really got some chill hangs on the bridge. Yeah. Worf is like... Do we truly need to send our chief engineer over to them? Bad idea. <laughs> Troy is like... Lieutenant LaForge is in great danger. And Riker does nothing. Yeah. It disappointed me. Yeah, he really, like, ignored people who have demonstrated themselves over and over again to give really good advice. Yeah, exactly. And this is... Uh, did you notice a couple of the interstitial scenes? Like, they actually show the Enterprise as a ship big dogging the pack led ship. The yeah. way they shoot those scenes also makes the ships themselves look totally, uh, yeah. like, totally at odds. Like, it, it, they're really cool shots, actually, because, like, the, the pack led ship will be, like, large in the frame, but the entire background will be, like, the saucer section of the Enterprise from yeah. below. Like, it makes it look so tiny. You get it practically in the space scene, but you also get it like intellectually everywhere else. Yeah. These and below. Mm -hmm. And underneath. And <laughs> missionary <laughs> position. <laughs> and but. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> so back on the shuttle. Yeah. Uh, Wes and Picard are actually kind of bonded. Yeah. So, not. There isn't. There's the cool bar brawl scene, which is cool. Well, the description of the bar brawl <laughs> The description of the lynching yeah. scene. <laughs> yeah. But that just sort of leads to the idea of. Wes recognizes the many sacrifices that Picard has made to attain the position that he's in, right. and begins to ask around about those and whether or not they are essential to the success of a Starfleet. Right. Like, did family. you need to forego having a family entirely, or like, is that like? Yeah. Did you make that choice for some other reason? And both generally and specifically, Picard is like. 
for ambitious staff, you know, because there are so constant involved. And Wesley does that thing that I've gotten many times, I imagine you've gotten many times, which is the sort of unwelcome question about when and how you're going to have kids. Yeah. And it it saddened me a little bit that that uh, sort of social grace hasn't because it kind of sucks. Yeah, that's a that's an inappropriate question to ask somebody at all, yeah. unless they're your partner. It's the most uh, it's the most intimate question. Right. And people uh, play it off like uh, like you gonna go see the game? Yeah. Like, I feel like they treat it like buying a house. Yeah. Parents sometimes think it's okay to ask their children like, "What are you guys gonna?" Yeah. Not even appropriate then. No. It's like, like we will we will keep you apprised of any family expansion opportunities that we're pursuing, but for now. It's weird. Yeah. Which is to say, uh, they do get pretty personal. And unlike the very clumsy way these conversations happen, which was just like, I'm going to be entering that nebula soon. Nebula, let's see if they work for us. Like I'm calling the thing on planning towards a nebula. If that's yeah, the one word, yeah, feel free to type in the nebula. Where's your nebula? For an episode Gas cloud that, uh, thing. Is as big of a turkey as this one is. Like, this actually oh, yeah, winds up... Wrong. This is a terrible episode. <laughs> this winds up being like a pretty, like, formative character scene for Picard. Yeah. And to a lesser extent, Wesley, I guess. Yeah. Um, but anyways, they arrive at the planet, and Wesley is like, Following Picard to the to the clinic, and uh, and uh, Picard is like, "What the fuck are you doing? Like, go take your stupid test, idiot!" And and Wesley's like, uh, "Sorry, the doctor kind of made me promise that I would actually watch you go into the, the clinic." <laughs> it's like when you like drop so somebody off their house, even though they live in like a really nice neighborhood. Yeah, give me a wave from the doorstep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But so Picard goes in and uh, he is uh, in surgery and his Federation doctors and they're like, we would red burka surgery uniforms. I thought they looked like the full body condoms from the naked gun. <laughs> yeah. Our, uh, they go all the way up. They're getting ready to uh, to to put him on the you know, He's really like, he's in a, a, a real mood. But, Isn't that a great patient yeah. at the moment? But this, uh, this uh, surgeon is just brimming with confidence. He's like, we're all being home in time for dinner. Don't you worry. Mm -hmm. And um, so we cut away from him. And Riker is hatching a plan to put a con job on these on these interstellar con men that are the Packlets. And so what they do is they, like, they, ra they FaceTime them up and they start saying to Jordy, like, hey man, like, sorry, we, there's nothing we can do. Our missions are always inherently dangerous, and any of us could be called upon to make the ultimate sacrifice. But here's a bunch of, like, super obvious, like, coded information that we're trying to do. Like, Speaking of time, this may be your time. Which is a bold move, given the fact that they've been, it's, like, demonstrable that the backlads are more sophisticated than they let on. Yeah. So, like, I don't know why they thought this would work. And, like, these, like, like, Riker does not play it cool. I shall personally miss you. Data does not play it cool. Goodbye, Jordan. Worf plays it kind of cool. Yeah. But, like... Worf is the only one who knows what he's doing in this yeah. episode. Yeah. <laughs> like, like he, he, like, totally gets the Best Actor Award for this episode. Any classified weapons knowledge you share with your captors will be considered treason. Because, like, when he's talking to Jordy and, like, transmitting code, he's not, like, winking and, like, emphasizing it in a weird way. He's like, you will never attain the 24th level of awareness. Just, uh, telling him what he needs to know. It's... This scene played for laughs for me, big time. Like, yeah. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> like, they're all sort of saying goodbye to him. Like, well, Jordy, it appears that you're fucked. Yeah. And uh, I think we need to leave you now. Yeah. Uh, also, you may be a traitor. And, <laughs> and don't be surprised if we kill you. Yeah. Worf's dialogue is so great here. 24 is the gateway to an heroic salvation. It made me think that, is Worf a part of some, like, weird... Going on Scientology cult. <laughs> Worf 
calculated the pack led to just assume it was some Klingon shit and not, you know, have a way of checking into it. <laughs> That's how good Worf is, though. Like, he wasn't fucking winking at the camera the entire time. That's just it. You see everyone being fucking buffoon, yeah. you're just assuming everyone is. <laughs> You, that's how easy it is to mistake someone for being a Scientologist. <laughs> Anyways. See, I will make myself look stupid if it means having a bit. Of fun. <laughs> I'm willing to do that. You're, uh, you're ready to throw yourself on that grenade. <laughs> um, I try. I flatter myself that I am, but uh, I just never come off looking that stupid. I don't know. Lord knows you try. <laughs> So the gambit works. They uh, over overcome the packlets and uh, are able to beat Jordy back before the packlets know what's up. And also, like, I guess they like armed them with photon torpedoes somehow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They they dazzled them with the crimson force field. Yeah. Not just putting down a towel, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. We gotta cut that one out. Oh yeah. <laughs> Getting a lot of uh, a lot of anger on the Twitter these days. Meanwhile, the arrogant surgeon that is operating with the guard has lost the the thread and is basically like. Yo, fuck, like, <laughs> this shit is not going super well. This is the scene in every Grey's Anatomy where, like, arterial spray is flying around <laughs> and a really sad song is playing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if Shonda Rhimes had uh, created this episode, it would have been far different. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, that would be good. I would watch that. Yeah, I would. She's not afraid of having like a lot of different television shows all going at the same time. So, anyways, they uh, they get Jordy back just in time to warp back to the star base, and Picard wakes up with Pulaski, like beaming down at him. Uh, if there's one situation you don't want, it's waking up after being sedated. And Polanski taking Polanski. rubber gloves off. <laughs> <laughs> well, all done. You should were very difficult. Uh, uh, Quite a bit of resistance. <laughs> Didn't you know that's futile? <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, revealed that she was the only person, the only doctor, doctory enough to complete his procedure and keep him alive. The card shows a card level of enthusiasm about that circumstance. <laughs> Not really grateful? A little bit embarrassed? No. So they beam back aboard the ship, and Picard kind of offhandedly announces to everybody that Wesley did really good on his tests, and that the result of that is that he gets to keep being on the ship. I didn't know the stakes were that high, did you? I didn't either. I mean, I feel like they should have... If he fails the test, does he stay on the planet? Yeah, like, <laughs> what the fuck was going on there? Yeah. I thought it was going to be like the same test as that episode where we met Chaotic Bro. Yeah. And that, like, if he did well, he goes on to Starfleet, but we, like, don't see what he does. Uh, it's, like, completely... We don't see him playing the Tetris. <laughs> yeah. If the stakes were that high, this was a pretty foundational Wesley episode because he played it ultra cool. Yeah, he's, like... He didn't go around asking ten people for advice. Yeah. It's, it's a, a, a whole new Wesley that we're seeing. Yeah, good job by him. I think uh, we've already made clear how we feel about this episode. Do you have any anything else you wanted to go over? Other than the fact that it was one of the worst episodes of the series. <laughs> like, it was almost insulting how the problems that were set up were so easily solvable and how people on the crew were, like, willfully trying not to solve them in a rational way. Right, it's like, like, our, uh, our friend Adam Ragusea of the, of the Pub podcast uh, 
think that you know, his favorite stakes are super low, mm -hmm. and like it's it's just about being Star Trek y and not about like solving problems. Yeah. And this like this episode like put the stakes all the way up at the top and then and then like lowered everybody's intelligence quotient to like make that make the problem seem tricky. Or you could almost be up a board ship in the last episode if they wanted to. And they were in real danger by fucking a ship full of Lenny's. Yeah. I feel like I feel like we're getting like the bends going from that episode to this episode. Yeah, no kidding. At any point did you find yourself a drunk Shimoda? Drunk Shimoda! A drunk Shimoda is the surgeon that uh, works up Picard before uh, before they call in the Pulaski big guns. Just the fucking arrogant confidence. <laughs> yeah. Just it made me laugh and like and then like the fucking panic in his face <laughs> when they cut back to him. Uh, and the operation is not going super well. <laughs> like, there's totally like, a smash cut to an extreme close-up going, we need a micro something something biologist. <laughs> yeah, way to begin a medical procedure with uh, the personnel that you don't need. Right, yeah. Or, or with personnel that you need but, but don't have. Yeah. So, that was my drug survivor. How about yourself? Uh, my drug Shimoda is Wesley because uh, there's a really fun scene in the shuttle where Wes and Picard are talking and uh, Picard's kind of cautioning Wes on the dangers of being distracted by women and <laughs> Wes like jumps all over this advice and is like oh no problem when women are concerned I am in complete control <laughs> like that is not an issue for me I know exactly where to put my dick <laughs> Every moment we've seen with Wes has been just a train wreck spinning into a power plant level of disaster. Uh -huh. Like, with all of his interpersonal <laughs> moments with girls. Like, <laughs> if he didn't have chocolate mousse on board the ship, like, oh, the he finger. would have never looked at a girl, basically. <laughs> so, that level of confidence in the face of, of, like, pretty strong factual... Yeah, we have a <laughs> lot of game tape to, to the contrary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, that comes up as pretty shimodity to me. So come on, Wes. <laughs> Who do you think you're fooling? Yeah, finish to get some on this. What do we have coming up on the next episode? Uh, our next episode is season two, episode eighteen. Up the long way. The crew of rescue a missing Earth colony leads to the discovery of a civilization composed entirely of clones. Oh, that looks good. Cool. Do you have any memory of this episode, Adam? I. Uh, is this the uh, space Irish episode? This is the space Irish episode. I only remember this episode as being ultra hokey and farmy. Like, yeah. did they build a farm on board the yeah, ship? Yeah, they like strew straw around in the in the. Uh, oh, is that what was the right okay. Are there barnyard animals? Yes. Oh my god. I kind of hate this the episode. Thing is, I was guessing all of the stupidest things I could imagine, and you're saying yes to all of them. I, I actually. I fucking hate it so much. Ooh. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the reception before I make up my mind about a counter veto. <laughs> okay. Terrible beyond terrible <laughs> is what it's been called. <laughs> that, that sounds about right. God damn it! The thing is, if I burn a counter veto here, it's over. How many more episodes do we have in season two? Like another thirty, right? Uh, I think this is a 22 episode season, so this you, know you got to experience the exquisite joy of counter vetoing me. <laughs> it wasn't that joyful. I had to watch a terrible episode. I I I feel some amount of envy for that. So I'm going to counter veto oh, you. No! No! I actually get to watch you jump on some guest room bed. See, that didn't go well for me either. Damn it, Adam. I wish I didn't see that. Are you really fucking serious? Yeah. Let's <laughs> watch it. Fuck you.
You know the worst episodes of this show are the most fun to riff on. Well, I'm not gonna veto a good episode. Yeah, yeah, why would you ever do that? Yeah, so I just want to avoid watching a terrible film. <laughs> so. The next episode is going to be the most flop housey episode of this podcast <laughs> that we've done yet. God, your reaction to my counter veto is giving me a little bit of counter veto regret. Like, <laughs> a little buyer's remorse. I can tell that you're sincere with how much you dislike this. This is a terrible episode, and I'm pretty bad that we're going to watch it. We should bust out some Space Guinness for this. <laughs> space Guinness and Space Jameson. <laughs> I'm excited to see it. Like, I don't think we you watched it. some it. Irish preview like box. Like <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. That is terrible. Um, I don't think we watched an episode so far that has been panned this universally. Yeah. Maybe outside of Code of Honor. Yeah. Like, this is a Code of Honor level oh, bad that we're that. sauntering up to. Yeah. So, great. Good job, me. Raise shields. Yeah. All right. Um, guess that's it. Yeah. Well, uh, if you would like to reach out to us on Twitter, please use the hashtag GreatestGen. I actually accidentally clicked on somebody that was using the greatest gen, and Are people doing that? I think people sometimes mm -hmm. add the or... or Finish it out as hashtag greatest generation. That's we're, not us. Uh, we're trying to save you some characters by just cutting it down to hashtag greatest gen. Yeah, and uh, you know, like I think those other two probably are more yeah. World War Two y and yeah. less Star Trek y than you want. So I mean, play in whatever hashtag you want, but right. we would recommend hashtag greatest gen. We're probably gonna see it if it's greatest gen. Yeah. I am at Benjamin R. A. U. Cha, and Adam is at Cut for Time. For a bit of this. We have a Facebook group, Greatest Generation. Change podcasts. We have a Reddit. Great. So they're done with my Greatest Gen, and I'm going back to some Potterless. My next podcast are, is a guy whose name I've just forgotten, who's reviewing Harry Potter book by book, chapter by chapter. We're going to hear the last half of the episode for episode 46, Half Blood Prince, chapter 15 and 16. Can't remember where it was. When she makes prophecy, she like zones out and doesn't really do anything. It's not like she's back five minutes. Thing. Whereas Ferenzi first crows about seven. Corbeck and Hermione corrects, I like really good Quidditch players and then leaves, which is savage, but also you're better than this Hermione. Like you don't need to stoop to Ron's shenanigans. Uh, it makes me kind of sad. Well, not only that, and I would only assume that most wedding players are this, you know, the similar stereotype of meathead. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't need them. She's yeah. a freaking genius. That is not right. She's confused because she's We're getting close to the center. I'll oh, see the stars. So I think it's going to be like really close to the center. Let's say, yeah, she's on that side. Like, together, I just I want this whole drama to get by that. Hermione's better than if they don't no, like the show. No, I also don't like that she yeah. called Cormac a very good footy player when he didn't make the team. <laughs> like, I get that she and did it, but great. like, Ron yeah. still did very well. She just made McCormack mess up that one time. And it's not like he was overwhelmingly better. He's not on the team, and he was never on the team. It's not like he used to be, and then Ron took a spot. Cormac was never on the Quidditch team. He's clearly not the best. <laughs> so, right, I didn't make my freshman volleyball team. I am not a very good volleyball team. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm sure you're great. I'm sure you are a wonderful bump set spider. I find that the eight are really healthy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's see. A further quote of Harry being confused by girls follows, which says, quote, Harry was left to ponder in silence the depths to which girls were sent to get revenge. <laughs> very, 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 very. As Harry is about to meet up with Luna to go to the party, he sees the gaggle of girls, and they are quite displeased. Uh, they look very grumpy, gathered together at the entrance hall to the party. Harry starts making small talk with Luna, asks if she heard that there's this one vampire in the town, and she goes, Oh, you mean Rufus Scrimger? And he goes, What? And she's like, Yeah, my father wrote this big expose about he's a vampire, <laughs> but the ministry doesn't want people to know. <laughs> You know, Luna just back on her bullshit. It's great. When he sees her, it reminded me of like a she's all that moment. Oh yeah. You know, because he was like, she never wear glasses, and 
like on her earrings. The bottle cap necklace. And it's like, Grace, she really cleaned up. I picture like all the music slowing. Yeah, they didn't do enough description of like, mm -hmm. does Luna actually look pretty? It just says that Harry is thankful that she didn't wear all the weird stuff, which is like a kind of selfish take of Harry to be like, well, well at least she's not dressed like an idiot while she was <laughs> at this party with me. But yes, I would have liked more of a she's all that moment or Ooh, the one of his like, after the Claire, Claire gives the girl that the makeover work. That would have been a fun moment to have here, I think. Tonight is she's like, you're not wearing your necklace. Tonight is the WrestleMania. Tomorrow is WrestleMania. Tonight is WWE Hall of Fame. We have to go watch this. So they enter the party with Red Carpet now. So it's more interesting. Eldred Warple, that's a name, who wrote the book about this vampire that is in attendance. This vampire's name is Sanguini, which sounds more like pasta than a Languini. This author mentions to Harry that he wants to write Harry's biography. And Harry is not he really does not want this to happen, but thankfully gets an out of this conversation because oh, Sanguini started. begins to follow some young girls quote with a rather hungry look in his eye and Warfle has to run off to stop it. Drive, drive. The pasta is gonna bite. He is hungry. Again, right. like Filch, this is a dangerous creature who's about to eat somebody. What's happening? Not the best security system. They gotta hire the Santa Barbara TSA. It also didn't sound like an easy process to write the book. No. Five-hour interviews, months, and he's, just, he's got stuff there's... I mean, it. Yeah, he was like, yeah, Harry, come on in. We'll knock it out in a couple four or five-hour sessions. But this he's got it. very important things to do. He's also going to worry about not dying. I don't know that he can really, you know, do this big expose. Also, I wonder if it's been... I always said the name you said the name you is that he's saying... He's a shitload of fucking stars. Yeah, yes, true. Wait, as I say this, <laughs> yes, I have read, I have read the first five parts of this biography, and I've enjoyed it. So uh, I am incorrect. Apparently, not bad books. I was going to look cool at colorism. Oh, it's orange. Yeah, it would have been great if went a little meta with this, and she was like, you know, maybe we could have like, say, a seven-part series about about your life. I'm thinking the first one about that duel you had in your first year. Maybe. We could have Yeah, come on, don't eat those children, Sanguini. Oh, Sanguini. Hermione <laughs> then rushes to Harry and Luna, looking quite disheveled. She says, quote, I've escaped. I mean, I just let Corbin. <laughs> Things are not going well with bringing him to the party. Harry says, serves you right. And Hermione goes on to say that she chose him just because she thought it would anger Ron the most. She even considered Zachariah Smith. And Harry's like, what? No, he's just everyone's least favorite person, which he sucks. I don't like him at all, so. He's in the Percy category for me, personally. I never know that the three of them can do their own thing. Oh, yeah. Give, yep. Put those three together and don't ever make a spin off of it. Because <laughs> I was thrown in the trash so quick. So, so the Nebula is just. Trelawney is a mother's name, but. Stand by a punch bowl, and she is more stars. a little tipsy. Luna goes up, talks to her. Trelawney asks, Why is there this high school this year? And Luna says, Oh, well, this year my class is with Ferenzi. And Trelawney goes on this big tirade about how she thought Dumbledore should have gotten rid of, quote, the horse, which, ooh, some pent up anger. But Trelawney, you're not a good teacher, so you don't get to, like, talk shit about other professors because you're you're not very good at your job. Yeah, it's well established. I looked up in that line, she yeah, that line Dobbin, looking out. which is rural slang for a horse. Oh, I thought that was just, like, his first name or something. Oh. So I am as smart as those other guests. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it just, it's rural slang for a horse, which, like, I don't know, there's slang for, I'm sure there's, I guess, like, mutt, you know, but so inappropriate. And he's magical. Like, mm -hmm. he's going to be better at divination. like, in him. Sure. And also, I think this is one of the very few scenarios where I've actually heard about two professors teaching the same course. Like, isn't it always, it's just, like, Slughorn is the potion for this. Yeah. And now there's two different Yeah. They do that to the potion that they had to bring in Ferenzi when Umbridge got rid of Trelawney and then they this did one of them traveling too for the Villa to do it. And I think they also explicitly mentioned for a few months have been traveling. It is well established and they know that Trelawney is not particularly good at her job, so they think she has a few classes that she can maybe manage it a bit better if she has less. You know, curriculum and stuff. I mean, because yes, she does have the magic in her, but when she makes prophecies, she like zones out and doesn't really do anything. It's not like an active thing. Whereas Ferenzi is, you know, is part of his being to understand celestial bodies and stuff. So I think it's partially because she's bad. There's an like half of the students who graduate from Hogwarts who are like really good at divination and some are okay. Well, I think, don't they? I think they said it where they alternate years. So it's like one year you take 
with Trelawney in one year, you take with Ferenzi, and then it alternates. I guess it depends on if you get an odd or even year, like if, which one you get more of. <laughs> They'll be like slightly better because you were because they're there for seven years, or you're just like really good at some aspects of divination, but really bad at other aspects of divination. I can only get outside. That's where I learned. <laughs> but yeah, I'm really good at planets, but very bad at tea leaves. Oh, Ferenzi taught you planets. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harry checks with Hermione that she won't tell Ron about the Cormac Jinx incident. She says she won't stoop that low. Harry says, good, because I need Ron for the team. And then Hermione says, ugh, boys in the Quidditch. Cormac won't stop talking to me about the best saves he's ever made. And like, what is Cormac talking about? He's never been on the team. Is this like some rightly bullshit that he does in the summer? Like, he's not on the team. Cool, tell me about your YMCA Quidditch League, Cormac. But like, I'm not impressed. You can't make any school to, like, what? I don't get it. And to be talking about that constantly, like, it's, it's as complex as bowling, right? Like, catch a snitch, you in. Mm -hmm. hit, hit down all those pins, like, hit down all those pins. <laughs> Good one, Carmen. Yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> he is the goalie, which seems like the hardest job since there are three things to defend. And, like, you would have some really cool stories about dramatic saves, because I feel like they'd all be dramatic. But, like, you don't get to brag when you are not on the team. Fine. And anyway, right? Ugh, I, uh, I miss Oliver Wood a lot. Later on, Trelawney then talks to Harry, and while she's doing so, Slughorn comes in and praises his potions ability, and then he sees Snape, so he brings Snape into the conversation, and Slughorn's like, well, actually, I should be giving you credit, Snape, because you were his teacher for the first five years, and Snape replies, funny, I never had the impression that I managed to teach Potts on anything at all. It's like, yeah, because you're a shitty professor, Snape. <laughs> you're bad at your job, you write shit on the board, and then you make fun of everyone that you don't like in the class, and then you're like, oh, I wonder why Neville Longbottom's bad at potion. Oh, maybe because I shit-talked him the whole year. Uh, you're not a good teacher, Snape. You should have been fired a lot. I think you gotta get in there. You gotta correct this as soon as possible. You, you're, you're about to punch the computer. <laughs> it's just, he's not good. He's not good at teaching. Right. It's like he only appreciates natural abilities. Or just Slytherin. So Nobody can improve. Yeah. Nobody can learn yeah. in this class. Learning is not what's there for perfection. You can juxtapose this with so McGonagall, who gonna be cool. really wants Neville to do well even though Transfiguration wasn't his strongest class, like, wants him to succeed and she wants to do whatever she can to help him out. It's just, it shows the difference between bad professors and good professors, where McGonagall really cares and is invested, especially in the kids that need more help, whereas Snape is like, oh, I don't like you because your dad was mean to me? Yeah, fuck this kid, I hope he makes dumb potions all the time. Gross, 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 don't like Snape. <laughs> So, Slughorn asks Harry what classes he's taking, he starts listing them off, and Snape sneers that they're all the classes for an aspiring R, and Harry goes, yeah, well, that's what I'd like to do, so... <laughs> I don't get why Snape thought this was an insult. It's like, yes, this is the profession I would like, I am taking the classes necessary. Say. Thank you, Professor Snape. A real brain, profession that is really well respected. Yeah, yeah. highly regarded. So, it's like he's starting the podcast, oh. you know, he's gonna be in <laughs> <order. laughs> Oh, those damn podcasts. Oh, especially a Harry Potter podcast. Who would do that? So Luna then tells <laughs> Harry that the Aurors are part of the Rotfang conspiracy, where they are trying to take down the Ministry from the inside with a combination of dark magic and gum disease. Harry then thinks to himself, quote, it had been worth bringing Luna just for this. <laughs> Which, yup, so good. So, so, so great. I love that Harry has a good approach to Luna's obnoxiousness, where he just, like, laughs it off rather than be like, oh, Luna's so weird. Like, I'm glad Harry's come around on Luna. Filch then brings Malfoy in to Slughorn, saying that Malfoy is trying to sneak into the party. Malfoy goes along with this, asks to be let in, Slughorn lets him in, but then Harry notices that Malfoy doesn't really look happy to be at the party, so Harry thinks something is up. Snake then asks Draco for a word aside, and they step out of the party, and Harry's like, oh, something's definitely up here. So I, reading this, is like, oh, right, the chapter has been called the Unbreakable Vow the whole time, like, they're gonna talk about it. And then Harry pulls the invisibility cloak out of his pocket. How big is his pocket? What is he wearing? <laughs> like, what? Right, if it's pocketable, I use it all the time. Yeah. Does it fold every, up really, every day, really small? Times. Like, I don't know if robes just have giant pockets, or if he's wearing, like, a hoodie, and he's got it in that, That's like, middle pocket right. where your two hands fit in or something. That was baffling to me, that very casual. It's just like, Harry pulls it out of his pocket. Like, this thing is supposed to cover his entire body. You can't just, like, put a blanket in your pocket. That's not how blankets work. It's like a poncho. <laughs> it's like a poncho. Yeah, okay, yeah. You know, oh. pay for it when it's raining. 
but still that's really big yeah i guess the thought is like if it is like a poncho where it's like really thin technically it could like you can bunch it up really really tiny like when people have those like emergency rain jacket situations that fold up really small and can fit in a tiny like zip pouch break, break when you sneeze on them <laughs> come on so it's a magic book about magic things maybe it's made of a magic material <laughs> i pictured when he pulled it out it was like, dun, 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 dun. and he's like sleuthing along the walls, even though he's invisible. Like so, so spy about it. I'm also imagining him pulling it out of his sleeve like a like a bad magician, like whoa, whoa but no one can see it because it's invisible. <laughs> What's he doing? Oh man. So Harry puts it on, sneaks down the hallway, and overhears Snape and Malfoy behind a locked door. Puts his ear to the keyhole and hears like starting in mid conversation them talking about what's going on. Basically. Snape is yelling at him for the cursed necklace thing. Of course, he knows the one. King Bill must have had an enemy. He yells at Snape mid-sentence, saying, hey, stop trying to do that, in reference to Snape trying to legilimend on him. Malfoy says that he can stop Snape. Then Snape says, oh, Auntie Bellatrix has been teaching you Oculumency, I see. Uh, and what's wrong to you trying to conceal from your master, Draco? And I'm not trying to conceal anything from him. I just don't want you or interference. Lots of Jenny Weasley. <laughs> she smokes I don't want her. I don't want her. Voldemort to know. So Snape says that he's trying to help Draco explain the Dow situation and how it like, what looks like you're <laughs> Says the job is mine. I'm going to do it. Even though it's got to be more than one minute. So boy, just fight towards your next one. Snape the plan. Snape is like, I want to help you. Five half ten. Half a And then I'll go. I'm not alone. But then Snape replies, Well, you were alone tonight, wandering about, which is foolish. And I'll go. Well, I wouldn't have been alone if you didn't put Crabbe and Boyle in detention. Which Snape did for them being really bad at defense against the dark arts. That's your spot. Not helpful. Join Bill checking out all the houses. <laughs> yeah, he does explicitly say, like, if you are putting your trust in Crab and Boyle, that's a problem. Like, this is not good if this is your backup team. Malfoy says he has other people working on it, though, better. See, again, he says you should confide in me. Malfoy says, I know what you're up to. You just want to steal my story. And then he storms out, and that at the end of chapter 15. Arms flailing. Not the <laughs> over as he runs down the hall crying. <laughs> but thankfully, Harry dodges all of these flailing arms. So then we get into chapter 16, which is a very frosty Christmas, which my first thought, like, from the movies. But obviously, the chapter starts with Harry feeling in Ron about what happened at the end of the previous chapter, like every chapter in Harry Potter. Ron is shocked, and especially does not believe the unbreakable vow part. As Ron says, quote, you can't break an unbreakable vow. And Harry says, I've worked out that much for myself, funnily enough. Ron mentions that if you break it, you die, which I don't know if they mentioned that in chapter two when Snape makes it, or if it was just like heavily implied. This wasn't too big of a shock to me, but Harry is like, whoa, that's a big deal. Nobody reads your diary, like, <laughs> like unbreakable, unbreakable, dude. Yeah. So Ron says that Fred tried to trick Ron into making an unbreakable vow when he was like five. But he recently busted and Riggle? yelled at them and said, You can't do this! And Ron says, Quote, Fred reckons his left buttocks has never been the same since. Harry replies, Yeah, well, passing over Fred's left buttocks. And then Fred enters in a bigger party. Oh, this is the same thing Fred has done this in this book alone. And this is my favorite trope that happens throughout the series. And I love it. This is the best use of this trope yet. Is Fred overhearing people talking about his butt when he walks in the room. Right, comes in, audience applause is, breaks the wall, 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 wings, gets back into yes, the Yes, he resumes it on his face. He goes, <laughs> Fred then presses Ron about laughing around. Ron says, mind your business. Fred replies, what a snappy retort. I really don't know how you think of Fred just murdering it. He then asks if Lester has had some sort of accident, and Ron, in anger, throws his knife that he was using to slice parsnips for Molly at Fred, and Fred turns it into an airplane with, quote, a lazy flick of his wand, which, oh my god, Fred is so good. I love this family. Molly sees this, of course, and says, don't you ever let me see you throwing knives again. Ron says, I won't, and then wait for her to leave, and then he mumbles under his breath, like you see, which is a classic move that I did as a teenager all the damn time. I can totally sympathize with Ron. I did this so much. <laughs> you, you won. You won that one. <laughs> can I talk about the knife in this situation? Totally. Because um, I know they talk about it later, but like the fact that Molly makes them cut the parsnips mm -hmm. when they get to Fendo and be done mm -hmm. with it, Molly is so in control. What a mother. It builds character. Huge fan. It's like the muggle equivalent of like not letting her kids watch TV. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, they're going to read a book. Uh -huh. so the TVs are faster. <laughs> you know, there they are, savagely cutting through a million parsnips. Yeah, it'll put a hair in your chest. 
Uh, so who is he running tonight? Charlie is in which uh, Why is Charlie in which Oh, serious, he's the best Weasley. I want to know more about Charlie. I'm so mad every time he's not included in stuff. That's what fan fiction's for. As soon as you're done, you can get as much Charlie as you want. I'm reading every Charlie Weasley thing as soon as I'm done, because I need to work. Blur has to bunk up with Ginny. Fred says, quote, that'll make Ginny's Christmas. <laughs> which is amazing. Fred confirms that Percy is not going to show up. Molly says, oh, I'm assuming he's too busy in the ministry. And Fred goes, or he's being the world's biggest brat. Ugh, great. Anytime you make fun of Percy, I'm down. Because that dude is the true villain of the series. My least favorite character. Not all Weasley. Not, <laughs> yeah, there's that one. Summer prefix. It's not over. Oh, I like it. That is a good tag. Ron and Harry get back to talking. Harry says that he's going to tell Dumbledore and maybe Arthur about this Malfoy thing, but he's afraid everyone's just going to tell him that Snape might have been doing it as a lie to Malfoy to try to get him to figure out what is going on, which honestly very well could be the reason, and my guess is that this is exactly what the reason is, and that Dumbledore is like, yo, you know, he's the spy. Do this for me, please. Is you got a that's big in the ankle and dressed it up in like and, and the little sketch at the top of chapter 62 well, of what just looks like is terrifying and much larger <laughs> than I was going And I am so very scared of these jokes. I thought they were like the size of your hand. These they are creeps. a Like a foot and a half tall and uh, super creepy. Not a fan. I don't understand. <laughs> there was a fight. They had a fight to cut them down. Also in the decorations, Ginny did such a paper chain explosion. Mm -hmm. She did so many paper chains that was like an explosion. Mm -hmm. Which... Again, without magic, I don't know if I can see Ginny, his boss, just like handful. <laughs> no, I bet she, I bet she snuck around and did some magic to make it happen and just take the car. Yeah, because <laughs> she's that much of a boss. So Mrs. Weasley puts on her favorite singer, Celestina Warbeck, who I believe we have heard mentioned in the series before as the only other band besides the Weird Sisters that exist. There's like two musicians. You can see Celestina and the Weird Sisters, and that is it. Fleur is in the room and she is not feeling it. She is clearly disgusted by the song. Ron is darting looks over to her and Bill to quote try to get tips, which ugh, gross. I don't even know about this. Mrs. Weasley starts out a sentimental moment about the song, mentioning that her and Arthur danced to this when they were eighteen. Just in case you notice Arthur, right, Arthur? And he was asleep. He's like, oh, 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 yeah, oh, mm -hmm, yes, wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> I love the song name, A Cauldron Full of Hot Strong Love. <laughs> yes, right. use that as the title or something. It seemed like the title of the song was definitely more risque than the lyrics because throughout the scene they kind of intersperse the lyrics of the song and they're not like that bad but like the title i was like oh okay like a bit spicy for family listening to music section come on family let's, let's just play out. some very white and talk about christmas <laughs> <laughs> so uh arthur and harry then start talking and arthur reveals that stan is still locked up and he's in azkaban which is like what they are doing this looking for appearances because Three arrests sounds better than three mistaken arrests and releases. So the ministry is back on their bullshit and is still corrupt and gross, even though Fudge is in the Harry tells Mr. Weasley the Malfoy thing, and Lupin overhears this and then kind of jumps into the conversation. And he basically gives the defense that Harry was expecting, saying Dumbledore <coughs> is Severus, and that ought to be good enough for all of us. Harry brings up, though, that Dumbledore isn't perfect and can make mistakes. And he asks Lupin, do you even like Snape? And Lupin replies, I neither like nor dislike him. Dot, dot, dot. No, Harry, I am speaking the truth, quote, as Harry pulled a skeptical expression, which I can very much envision, and I like a lot, and I hope it's in the movie, but if I've learned anything from the movies, all the good stuff like this gets on the kind of movie floor, so I'm not expecting it. I won't tell you, verbal. <laughs> <laughs> also, like... He doesn't even have a good haircut. Like, do you like him? Like, that's not a good liar. <laughs> exactly. If he's, you know, he's he's Though they do say his hair's bad. <laughs> um, Lupin says, we shall never be bosom friends, which, is that a British way to say, like, best buddies? Because bosom friends is a very strange term, and I don't know if British people actually say That's weird to me. Now it is time for British Forgeries, the same type as Forgeries, Jolty James. Bosom Friends is an English term to mean someone that is very close, two close friends. It comes from the idea that you can have heart to hearts with someone, that their hearts are close, i.e. their bosoms are close, and it's usually bosom buddies, not bosom friends. 
by the leaves amongst the youths. This has been British Quandaries with UK correspondent Dorothy James. It is a friend you are so close that you will touch bosoms with, mm. which must be a very deep level. <laughs> so uh, it says we shall never be bosom friends, but don't forget that Snape did make me wolfsbane potion every month while I was teaching. So Lupin is being very chill about this, very mature, and I very much like Lupin's approach to this, where he's like, look, I don't have a strong opinion about the guy, but I really trust Dumbledore, and Dumbledore trusts this guy, so I'm okay. Which is basically the approach that everyone should have, but very Lupin starts talking about how Harry is basically determined to hate him, and that it's understandable for Harry to hate him because of the way that Snape has been, and the whole history that Snape and Harry's father have, but he basically tries to reassure Harry that Snape very well could just be following Dumbledore's orders, and we've got to leave it at that. After he does this, the song ends, and Fleur goes, Is it over? Thank goodness we're in our boat, and that is the key for everyone. On this very important song to Mrs. Weasley, like Fleur is not great. She's not doing smart things. You gotta be nice to your potential future mother-in-law. Well, I've been one day below. That was strange. It's Sagittarius. Jump, 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 jump. Next tip. But she ain't here. Love it. We talk up in the rubble. We talk up. You were talk up. He's been following Fenrir Greyback, and I wanted to double check. This is who Malfoy mentioned back a couple chapters ago to the was listening right? so like, like, to listen to the store wall and he's like, don't you need to stick a ray back on you. You are paying close attention. Okay, good. Yeah, as I was gonna say, you are more apt than Harry. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm he doesn't remember it in the scene, right? Yes, after the back important back. song, the important song. Lupin starts talking about how Harry is basically determined to hate him and that it's understandable for Harry to hate him because of the way that Snape treats him and the sort of history that Snape and Harry's father had. So he basically tries to reassure Harry that Snape very well could just be following the orders and he's got to go stop after he does this. The song ends and Fleur goes, is it over? Thank goodness with an arable and that is the cue for everyone to go to bed. Shit on this very important song to Mrs. Weasley. Like, Fleur is not great. She's not doing smart things. You gotta be nice to your potential future mother in law, even if you don't agree with her, Fleur. That's like how in laws work. Get out of here, Delacroix. <laughs> Delacroix. Delacroix. Yeah, go talk your Pompla Moose flavored Delacroix. So, Harry asks Lupin what he's been up to. Apparently, Lupin has been living amongst werewolves to spy on them at the request of Dumbledore. He's been following Fenrir Greyback, and I wanted to double check. This is who Malfoy mentioned back a couple chapters ago to Borgen, right? When he's like threatening him against the store wall and he's like, Don't make me stick Ray back on you. I believe this is the same guy. You are paying close attention. Okay, good. Yeah, as I say, you are more apt than Harry. <laughs> yes. yes. Because he doesn't remember it in the scene, right? Yes, and that's what made me worried for a second. I was like, wait, this is normally the part where Harry would be like, Harry recalled that Draco said this blah blah blah, but I guess uh, JK wants to save this for people to go back and read without being explicitly told it and be like, aha, which someone actually just sent me an email to the Podwillis Gmail account about all of the like, little things that are peppered in and uh, aren't mentioned. Like in book two, Arthur talks about Mendungus Fletcher for like a sentence and then you don't meet him until a couple books later. So there's like a bunch of these things peppered in. J.K. Rowling does this where like sometimes she will refer back and it'll be like, Harry, remember? But there's other times where she just like lets it go under the rug and I'm missing this. What kid are like, oh, uh, remember my friend Tom? Like, not I remember Tom. Like, remember my friend Fenrir Greyback? <laughs> yes, I, I remember, remember that guy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, yeah, so we learned that Fenrir Greyback is the head werewolf. I thought he was just like some brutish big dude that was going to be like the equivalent of a bodyguard. But no, he's much more than that. He is the head werewolf that wants to spread the werewolf's numbers as much as possible, and he encourages biting children to try to turn them against wizards at an early age. This is very intense. Very intense. I created a name for this. Okay. Uh, a pedophile. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna think of that trademark. That's good. Pedophile. <laughs> so useful. Uh, I love it. So Greyback is also the one who bit Lupin, which plot twist. Lupin mentions that at first he thought not to blame him once he started having these things where he turned into a world. He's like, oh, I can never blame someone for betting someone else. Like, once you're a werewolf, you can't really control anything. But then he got to learn about Greyback more during this undercover reconnaissance mission, and he realizes that he should not be nice towards Greyback and try to not blame him. He should blame him because he's learned that Greyback 
positions himself near his potential victims on full moon specifically so that when he turns he will bite them so Greyback, not a good dude by any means at all lupin said that voldemort has promised him prey in return for his services so basically voldemort gets to use werewolves as henchmen slash guard dogs or whatever and voldemort gives them people to bite my children buffet hogwarts <laughs> express <laughs> yep pretty much so Harry then asks about the Half-Blood Prince, Lupin says the Half-Blood what? So clearly he's never heard of him. Harry really wants it to be a marauder and keeps asking these pressing questions and Lupin continually denies. Harry brings up Levicorpus, which is something that the Half-Blood Prince invented, and Lupin goes, oh yeah, that was very popular during my tenure at Hogwarts, but Jinx is going in and out of style, which makes me like imagine that there's like some Jinx equivalent of cargo shorts where it's like, oh, you used Flipendo? Really? Come on, Richard, get it together. Right. In the 80s, they just had, like, Cr Crimpus Maximus, everything, neon, neonis, whatever the style. I love that concept. Yeah. Lupin then gives Harry the idea to check out how old the book is. So just before bed, Harry does so, and he finds that the book has been published 50 years ago. But that's the published date? I don't understand, like, what that's going to do, but Harry's like, ah, throws it aside in disgust. And it says it was published 50 years ago. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, they're, I think they're really trying to make you think that it's Voldemort, which I don't know who the Half-Blood Prince is, but I really do think that it's Snape, and I'm very convinced. This is, again, could be the following the fucking thing you started out with. Aaron situation that I fell for very badly in the fourth, but I think that with them really trying to make you think it's Voldemort, it's actually Snape. Next morning, it's Christmas. Ron has received a gross necklace from Blackbird that says, My Sweetheart on it. Harry says, Nice! You should definitely wear that in front of Fred and George. Ron's like, Ah, oh, stop! Uh, uh, why would you give this to me? Harry says, Well, think back. It's a test. <laughs> it really is. Harry says, Well, think back. Have you ever let it slip that you'd like to go out in public with the words, My Sweetheart, round your neck? Like, Harry, taking a page out of the Ginny slash Fred Weasley book, just saucing up Ron. Love it. Ron says that they don't talk much. Harry's like, oh, right, because it's all snogging. Ron confirms. Everyone has new Weasley sweaters at Christmas lunch, except for Fleur, which is amazing. Harry's has a snitch on it, and the other gifts that Harry got for Christmas was a bunch of wizarding wheezes from Fred George, as well as a box from Creature, which turned out to have maggots. Which is a great gift. Who would love a good set of maggots? While he's at lunch, there's a maggot, like, in his hair. And Ginny like pulls it out of his hair, and Harry quote erupts in goosebumps that had nothing to do with the maggots. So again, big old hormones dripping out of his ears. Ron spills gravy trying to pass it to Fleur. Bill saves it before he can get anywhere, and Fleur's like, "Oh, you are as clumsy as the tongs." And Molly is not happy about that. I, Fleur is just digging a deeper and deeper hole. Everything that Molly likes in Fleur is just shit. Then, since the conversation has turned to Tonks, Harry's like, oh, right, her Patronus changed, and starts to ask this to Lupin. Harry starts to put two and two together that it probably has changed into Sirius's dog, Patronus. But before they can get into that, Percy approaches, and it's not just Percy. It's Percy and Scrimger, because Percy is a fucking narc and has brought the Minister of Magic. Bring your boss to Christmas Day. Ugh, it's so bad. They go in and they lie, saying that, oh yeah, we were doing work in the area and Percy couldn't help but see his family, which everyone's like, uh, what? Then Scrimger says like, oh, I'll just take a look in the garden and just walk around. Maybe someone should come with me. How about you there? Pretending to not know Harry's name, even though there were a bunch of other people that were done like singling out Harry. So everyone's like, oh, okay, this is it. And everyone like tries to talk to Harry's like, are you sure? And Harry's like, this is fine. Yes, this is okay. And they go outside and Scrimger has a awful conversation with Harry that largely results in Harry either not saying anything or just putting down exactly what Scrimger tries to say. Basically, Scrimger tries to talk to him about the prophecy. He refuses. He wants to talk about Dumbledore. He refuses. He tries to talk about Harry going in and out of the ministry to make it look better. And Harry's like, this is weird. Yeah, then Scrimger goes on this thing about how, like, it doesn't matter if Harry's actually the better. chosen one, just that people think he's the chosen one. It, I, like, I Fuck thought Scrimger was okay. I am very anti-team Scrimger. Like, I got this card on eBay. He's very well, bad. Well, give him a PC so I can play better with me and the PC as well. It's an 80s version of Zero Way Out. <laughs> so 
Look, I was cards up. This, this is an old piece you have for the cards up. Yeah, need it. Need money back. Like, do you know what Dumbledore's been doing when he's not explaining? I was like, I don't know. And then Scrooge's like, I think Tinder Buck knows. It was Tinder Buck. Lupin says the half blood. What? So clearly he's never heard of him. So I'm looking at my garbage card. GT X seven six eyes. Harry brings up Levicorpus, which is the only one that has blood on his hands. Oh yeah, that was very popular during the Harry Potter movie. Jinx is going in out of style, which makes me like imagine that there's like some Jinx equivalent of cargo shorts. Was like, oh, you used Flipendo? Really? Come on, Richard, get it together. In the eighties, they just had like Jinx and Maximus, Neon, Neonus. What a garbage card! It's the Euro Truck Simulator. Lupin gives Harry the idea to check out how old the book. So just to slow down, how you can also find it. But that's the published date? I don't understand like what that's gonna do, but Harry's like, ah, throws it aside and discuss. And it says it was published 50 years ago. Didn't Tom Riddle go to school 50 years ago? So I think they're again trying to heavy-handedly make you think that that happened. I think so, yeah. Yeah. The ISBN number adds up to 18. <laughs> All of the numbers in ISBN are I am Lord Victor. <laughs> they spell it Tom Marble or Riddle. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, they're, I think they're really trying to make you think that it's Voldemort, which I don't know who the Half Blood Prince is, but I really do think that it's Snape, and I'm very convinced. This is again, could be me falling for the Ludo Bagman type red herring situation that I fell for very badly in the fourth, but. I think that with them really trying to make you think it's Voldemort, it's actually Snape. Next morning, it's Christmas. Ron has received a gross necklace from Lavender that says, My Sweetheart on it. Harry's like, nice. Nice. you should definitely wear that in front of Fred and George. Ron's like, the other gifts that Harry got for Christmas, but it's like, oh, you are as clumsy as the don'ts. And Molly is not happy about that. Like, Fleur is just digging a deeper and deeper hole. Everything that Molly likes, Fleur is just shitting on. Then, since the conversation has turned to Tom's, Harry's like, oh right, her Patronus change, and starts to ask this to Lupin, Harry starts to put two and two together that it probably has changed into Sirius's dog, Patronus, but before they can get into that, Ooh, Percy approaches, and it's not just Percy, it's no, Percy really and Scrimger, because Percy is a fucking narc, and has brought the Minister of Magic. Bring your boss to Christmas Day. Ugh, so bad. They go in and they lie, saying that, oh yeah, we were doing work in the area, and Percy couldn't help but see his family, which everyone's like, then Scrimger says, like, oh, I'll just take a look at your garden and just walk around. Maybe someone should come with me. How about you there? Pretending to not know Harry's name, even though there were a bunch of other people that were done, like, singling out Harry. So everyone's like, oh, okay, this is it. And everyone, like, tries to talk to Harry. He's like, are you sure? And Harry's like, this is fine. Yes, this is okay. And they go outside. And Scrimger has an awful conversation with Harry that largely results in Harry either not saying anything or just putting down exactly what Scrimger tries to say. Basically, Springer tries to talk to him about the prophecy, he refuses, he wants to talk about Dumbledore, he refuses, he tries to talk about Harry going in and out of the ministry to make it look better, and Harry's like, this is weird. Then Scrimgeour goes on this thing about how, like, it doesn't matter if Harry's actually the chosen one, just that people think he's the chosen one. It, I, like, I thought Scrimgeour was okay. I am very anti-team Scrimgeour. He sucks a whole lot. He's very bad. Harry was, like, just a minute away from being... It's an A to B conversation, so see your way out. <laughs> so sassy. Like, get out of here, Scrimgeour. He sucks. Yeah, at one point he says something like, Do you know what Dumbledore's been doing when he's not in school? And Harry's like, I don't know. And then Scrimgeour's like, And you wouldn't tell me if you did, did you? And he goes, No, I wouldn't. So Harry's like, Basically, Scrimgeour is seeing that he's going to try to go out. And he's going to go out. And he says, You know, it's not going to work out. Even though you seem cleverer than Fudge, I'm going to learn from his mistakes. Dumbledore's still a master. Fudge isn't working there anymore. I'd leave Dumbledore alone if I were you. There's a long pause, and then Scrimgeour's like, Well, it's clear to me that you've done a very good job on you. Dumbledore's man through and through, aren't you? And Harry says, Yeah, I am. I'm just reading that now. Turns away, and that is the end of the chapter. That is the end of this episode. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and like you, we don't read it before 
we read it live on air, so it's a little improvised, and, and you get our honest the reactions, and um, the this was especially exciting because we have like this whole running joke I about the bearings. Slughorn is the furniture that all of the students are having sex on. <laughs> Yes. So I was especially it's not That's Slughorn, awesome. it's his evil um, brother Flughorn. So um, <laughs> oh, Ron and Lavender are twisted in the chair that might be Flughorn just in the wrong place. That's amazing. So that is so good. Um, anyway, so check us out. We just finished our sixth season. We're in between seasons, and so we're excited to have you on. It's gonna be great. We'll try and do this without spoiling anything for you. Yes, that would be very important. <laughs> we'll be starting season seven soon, which uh, each season's a different pairing. So there's something for everybody. Oh, yeah. Even those bum bridges are. Oh. Bum bridges. <laughs> <laughs> well, Danny, thank you again so much for being on. Everyone go listen to Potterotica. They also, you guys also have an amazing Facebook group that I was a part of for like half of a day. And then there were like too many spoilers where I was like, I'm very excited to finish the book and get more invested into that. Harry You'll Potter be welcome group. back. <laughs> because you guys are sharing some great stuff. I'm very, very excited to be there. Uh, but yes, thanks again for being on. Listeners, thanks for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, before they begin Christmas meals, wizard on! If you go to our website, Potterless Podcast. No, we're going to end it for the rest. Okay. Okay, try to bring us some sugar. Feels good. Just like that. Feels good. Oh, shit. Pay attention. Keep it. So, this whole stream, I managed to get to the nebula we were looking for. It was uninspiring. It was like this, but just a slight blue shade over one bit and a bit brown over the other, as opposed to black stars. There's a lot of stars here. In that wee sector. Fuck all there. There's something else in there. Is okay? There's a lot of stars there. I don't know why there's so many there. But anyway, let's find this. This was just a pair of Let's go get a bit more fuel. Fill that up. Turn it off. I don't let that fucking sun get far away. Let's look at that down. We're going to get some fuel soon. See where I am. Come on, slow down, slow down. So if, if anybody has actually watched, I don't know how long I've been streaming in the last hour or two. I hope you've enjoyed seeing some elite. Obviously I've not been scanning planets or stars. Attention. I've not been in the whole scanning thing, just trying to get into that nebula. And as you might have seen earlier, if you if you haven't, jump back. That's going the wrong way. Ends in five minutes. Alright, let's see where the ocean goes up. Ends in five minutes. I'm not losing the bed, I'm not going past 40. Give fucking fuel. Where's my fuel? 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 Right, well, where are we next? Going over that way. That's roughly the direction I'm going, make sure I'm far enough away from the sun, so when I kick back in, I can use my booster and ship it over here. I think it's time to cut engines. Drop down to my lowest super cruise speed and drop out of super cruise. Come on, dead stop. 
check my ship and see what looks done. Probably gonna be beat up to hell. Right, it needs it needs repainted. When I get back for such shit, I'm go paint it. Wait, where's the camera first? Let me see if it's open. Let's try and spin the camera. Nope. Jeez, I hate the controls for this camera. Nope. That one. That way. There we can go. Got many paint left. It's meant to be blue. It's mostly blue, but you can see a lot of paint just fucked up. Well, take it there. Save it and exit, I suppose. Anyone who's watched me this far, thanks for watching. There's other streams. Uh, if you go to, you want to see more, I'm on YouTube mainly under youtube.com uh, slash munro78. Just pretty much same as my Twitter name, which is up in one of these corners somewhere. I don't know. Thanks. Bye. Wait, that's, that's not where I quit my stream. Ah, try again. Goodbye, have a wonderful time.